the emerging world leader. There are 33 different titles for him in the Old Testament. Among the more well-known ones, the seed of the serpent in Genesis 3, he's the idle shepherd of Zechariah 11. That's the only physical description of the Antichrist in the Bible, and it is there. Um, he's the little horn of Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. He's represent a horn is an is a ancient symbol of authority. Um, he's the prince that shall come, as I've mentioned before. He's called the willful king in Daniel 11. And these are all in your notes, of course. And in the New Testament, there's 13 titles there. Uh, he's the beast of Revelation 11 and 13. He's called the false prophet in Revelation 13, the second of the two guys. The word Antichrist is a strange label, by the way. We call, that's the one that sticks. That's the one we say, Antichrist, we all think we know what we're talking about. It's a little weird because that word is only used by John, and it's not used of him. John uses the term in his letters to represent a spirit, a, a spirit of Antichrist. It's not, he's not really talking about an individual per se. The word Antichrist doesn't mean against Christ, technically. It means in, in the place of Christ. A pseudo-Christ is more precise. Antichristos in the Greek isn't what it sounds like to us. Obviously, he's against Christ, but the word really means he's in the place of Christ. That's why there's all this talk about the Pope and all that sort of stuff. But in any case, what's interesting is John, who's the only guy that uses that term in a different context, in the entire book of Revelation doesn't use the term Antichrist. He uses several other terms, by the way. But nevertheless, that's the label that has stuck, if you will, in modern usage. So I won't fight that. Just be aware of the fact that it's a strange inversion here. He's called the lawless one in 2 Thessalonians 2. He's called the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. Jesus calls him the one who comes in his own name. I come in my Father's name, you receive me not. Another comes in his own name, and him you will receive. That's why many of the experts believe he'll be Jewish. We don't know that. We know he's accepted by Israel for some weird reason, but whatever. Okay, so that's... Uh, and he's called the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians 2. And uh, is he a Jew or Gentile? There are good scholars that take both sides. Some say he'll be, the leader will be the son of Satan. That's clearly from the scripture. Some believe the leader will be a Jew, and there's a whole bunch of arguments for that. And uh, uh, also there's a, some believe he'll be a Gentile, and there's a whole bunch of arguments for that. So you can take your pick. But let's, when we get into those arguments, remember there's two guys. We're not talking about a single guy. There's a single political leader, but he has a religious priest promoting his worship called the false prophet as a second title of him, if you will. And so, coming world leader. The term that I would use if I was writing in this area is I'd call him Mr. Big Mouth. Because it's interesting in Daniel 7 and in Daniel 11, in Psalm 52, in 2 Thessalonians 2, he is always shooting off his mouth. He's making arrogant claims. That's one of his characteristics. So if you want a title for him, I'd call him Mr. Big Mouth. Six times in the scripture he's called that. He will be a son of Satan in some sense. And uh, he'll be an intellectual genius, obviously a brilliant guy. The guy that's coming is going to be fantastic. He is going to be the most attractive guy the world has ever seen. We'll know better by the Holy Spirit, but the world won't see that. They're going to see a guy with the answers, with a plan to help the world out of its mess. He'll be an oratorical genius. I don't think he needs teleprompters. Okay? He will be a political genius. He'll be a commercial genius. He will be a military genius. He, does, he comes to power by peacemaking, not by military, but he becomes so powerful that he will be militarily very, very able. He'd be a governmental genius. He'll be a religious genius. He's, he's all of these things. The scripture supports every one of these. And there's a bunch of other passages in your notes you can take a look at if you're trying to get up to speed on, on who this guy is. And so Isaiah 10 gives us some identities here. Thus, therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. That's interesting. He shall smite thee with a rod, and he shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. And yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. This is Isaiah talking in Isaiah 10. Look at Isaiah 15. That I will break the Assyrian in my land, upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off of them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. 
And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. This world leader was originally Nimrod, who was an Assyrian. The first world leader was, a Nimrod, was Nimrod, the Assyrian. The last world leader on the planet Earth will be an Assyrian. It's interesting, the symmetry I think is very provocative. And uh, then will I break the Assyrian uh, in my land and so forth. The Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard and he shall show the lightning down from his, of his arm with the indignation of his anger and with the flame of a devouring fire and with scattering the tempest and the hailstones. For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with See, I want you to see, not get into the details, but you see the term Assyrians all through Micah and all through Isaiah as an identity here. And uh, Micah 5, and this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land. And he shall tread in our palaces, and we rise against him with seven shepherds and eight principal men. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land, when he treadeth within our borders. And again, we have the Assyrian, the Nimrod even again, and the Assyrian. So there's more homework to be done. Is he Muslim? Very likely. But that's not his defining characteristic. He's a, and the people, the prince that, prince that shall, the reason, there's a, a whole mis, misunderstanding. In Daniel 9, verse 26, it says, the pr people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. They were the Roman legions. But Roman legions were not necessarily European. The legions of Rome were conscripts. The 10th legion, which is the one that brought the temple down, were cohorts and auxiliaries from a number of uh, uh, cohorts that are all Assyrians. So the people of the prince that shall come were the ones that destroyed this. That's, that, that linkage is what's caused many writers to presume that somehow it's a, Euro, it's a Western Europe player in the, the, uh, the end times. But let's shift and talk about the mark of the beast. People who know nothing about the Antichrist all know about the 666. That's a very pop. There are books written that totally miss the point. Let's go at this. Revelation 13, and he causeth both, uh, he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. These people take a sign of allegiance to the leader. And for some reason, they have it in their right hand and on their foreheads. And there's a couple of possibilities about that, but to understand the, nu the number isn't the person's number, it's his number. They're taking his identity as a sign of allegiance. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 600, three score and six. And around that, books have been written that talk about barcodes and in certain inserting things and all that sort of stuff. It turns out the 603 score and 6 is an inference from the Greek letters. There are three Greek letters there in the original text, uh, and these three Greek letters have numerical values of 660 and 6. So those three letters can be construed geometrically as a number 666. If that is correct, it's the only place in the Bible that the text leans on ge geometria the numerical value of the letters. The fact that the letters have numerical value is very interesting from a number of points of view, but it's not used by the Holy Spirit to communicate directly, unless this is one of them. Now, these three uh, letters have names. The first and last is the, f is the first and last letters of the word Christos. But you put this little serpent thing between the two and you get a symbol that seems appropriate for the Antichrist. So that's that is played upon by some writers, and that's okay, no problem. The Antichrist, or Pseudo-Christ, if you will, is symbolized by those three letters. And those three letters ha apparently have the number 666. So that's the subject of a lot of uh, uh, conjectures. But whose number are we talking about? We're not talking about our number, we're talking about his number. Insertable chips, RFID, barcodes, that has to do with my number. If I have a credit card or something, that's not the issue, it's his number that I want an identity with. They're different. See, they missed the point. And it's his number and name that are critical identity issues. Now, in Al Greek alphanumerics, okay, 
those three letters have the value 666 that I've just shown you. And uh, so it is wh wh whatever it's worth. People say, well, that's gematria. No, wait a minute, guys. Wait a minute. When you say gematria, what gematria are you talking about? There's the normal uh, form of gematria. There are ones where you take the, number, uh, the values plus the number of letters. Another one, you take small values, 10. And there are all kinds of games you can play with gematria. And um, this is one of those places where I suggest to you, you remember that if you torture the data long enough, it'll confess to anything. You can fool around with these numbers to prove anything you like. So I wouldn't try to prove anything with gametria. There are aspects of that that are worth studying. It's kind of fascinating, but don't, you don't put doctrine on it. That's naive. There is a passage in Zechariah 11, which is the only physical description of the Antichrist I'm aware of in the Bible. Woe to the idol shepherd. That's not, not lazy. That's the false worship kind of idol. Woe to the idol shepherd that leaveth the flock. A sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. This leads to a conjecture that the Antichrist, who apparently suffers from a head wound, is thought to be dead and comes back to life, but he may ha apparently has an impaired ha arm, his right arm, apparently. Um, his sword shall be upon his arm, don't know if it's right or left, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. He's blind in one eye. And it's not Moshe Dayan, that was the wrong eye, he was a left eye. But anyway, the point is, um, um, maybe the identity of his followers reflects that by having something on their forehead and in their right arm to claim an identity. That's a possibility. There's even a more provocative possibility we'll come to in a minute. But that's one possibility I wanted you aware of, to be aware of. <laughs> The Antichrist is a strange label, by the way. We call that's the one that sticks. That's the one we say Antichrist. We all think we know what we're talking about. It's a little weird because that word is only used by John and it's not used of him. John uses the term in his letters, as I've mentioned before. He's called the willful king in Daniel 11. And these are all in your notes, of course. And in the New Testament, there's 13 titles there. Uh, he's the beast of Revelation 11 and 13. He's called the false prophet in Revelation 13, the second of the two guys. The word The emerging world leader. There are 33 different titles for him in the Old Testament. Among the more well known to represent a spirit, a, a spirit of Antichrist. It's not, he's not really talking about an individual per se. The word Antichrist doesn't mean against Christ, technically. It means in, in the place of Christ. A pseudo-Christ is more than the seed of the serpent in Genesis 3. He's the idle shepherd of Zechariah 11. That's the only physical description of the Antichrist in the Bible, and it is there. Um, he's the little horn of Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. He's represent a horn is an is a ancient symbol of authority. Um, he's the prince that shall come.